Hello everybody, welcome to BJ Investigates, a show I just created and might never do again. So I have already discussed Steve-O the Clown many times before on my other channel, That Surprise Witness. But today we wanted to take a deeper dive into Stephen Gilchrist Glover the first. So it's probably gonna at least be a two-part situation here. Let's get started. I'll kind of throw y'all into the introduction and then we'll talk about Steve-O's early life. Now I did not know a lot of this stuff. It is news to me. So let's get into it. You may know him as one of the recovery bros infecting the podcast circuit, or you may know him from Jackass, an MTV franchise show from the early 2000s. While he may be attempting to silence the free band movement right now, he wasn't always in such volatile relationship with the Jackass fans. Back in the early 2000s, Steve-O was a fixture of the entertainment industry, and with that came fame, money, power, and tons and tons of drugs. While Steve-O says he's sober now, there were some very, very dark years during Steve-O's rise to fame where Steve-O was quite literally destroying his human body. The human one, specifically. Probably the astral, the light, all of them, the Merkaba, probably destroying a lot of the bodies, but specifically the human one as well. The show he was on was a big hit on MTV, thus the movies and TV spinoffs kept rolling, and by proxy, the injuries to the Jackass cast kept rolling as well. Even with multiple injuries under Steve-O's belt, the show had to keep going on, sacrificing his already broken human body time and time again for the entertainment of Viacom's properties. The jackass machine was pushing Steve-O to the point of no return, and he nearly died multiple times. It's a wild chance that Steve-O is even still alive. On June 13th, 1974, wow, that was a long time ago, the man's old, in Wimbledon, England, a wealthy couple named Richard and Donna Glover welcomed Stephen Gilchrist Glover into the world as their firstborn son. When Stephen was just six months old, his family took up and left for Brazil because his father's job as the South American director of Pepsi Cola. Now, Steve-O's childhood was full of traveling. Before high school, Steve-O had lived in Venezuela, Connecticut, Florida, back to England, Canada, England again. Needless to say, Steve-O grew up extremely wealthy. However, this had a price tag of never spending any time with his father and growing up with a full service staff instead of a family. His father was away and his mother was an alcoholic. She even fed Steve-O alcohol to calm him down as a baby. Each time Steve-O would move, he would take it as a shot at being cool at a new school. Sadly, this did not always work out in his favor. As he started growing older, Steve-O would begin acting out. One of these instances was on October 25th, 1987, when Steve-O scoured the yellow pages, found out where his favorite band, Motley Crue, was staying, and met his idol, Tommy Lee. On October 25th, 1987, when Motley Crue came to Toronto on Girls, Girls, Girls Tour, I figured out the name of their manager, and I called every single hotel in the yellow pages asking for Doc McGee's room. So I was 13 years old when I met Nikki Six and Tommy Lee. Tommy, dude, we might not get another chance. Yeah, dude, come on. <laughs> Good to see you. Yeah, dude, finally, man. Yeah. Haven't seen How you since 1987. <laughs> <laughs> this was a major turning. Wasn't he also one of those creepers that had like a 13-year-old girlfriend too, Tommy Lee? That is disgusting. I learned that from a deep dive. If I learned it, it was probably on YouTube. This was a major turning point for Steve-O as he realized the world was truly at his fingertips. Right as he was beginning to get more and more rebellious, he also discovered skateboarding. Yeah, I went to high school at the American School in London, England, all four years of high school. Well, when I was 15 years old, I, my dad won a video camera in a golf tournament. So he just kind of stuffed it in his closet. As soon as I took that camera away from my dad, like we were off to the races making skateboard videos all over London, England. And by the time he noticed it was missing, I had already made like home edited, you know, like skate videos. And I just showed them to my dad and he was super psyched. He was actually glad I stole the camera, I think, because 
you know, the seldom times when I ever showed any actual initiative to, you know, be motivated on my own. When Steve puts his mind to something, to do something, he can do anything that he wants to do. Uh, the problem is that that's a fairly narrow slice of the pie. <laughs> <laughs> so it starts off, it's not that terribly good quality. My, my way of editing was to record, I mean, my way of editing for years, you know, like all the way up to like when Jackass started, like I was editing back and forth on VCRs. I don't know, yeah, if, if, if I thought a trick was extra cool, you know, I would like hit pause and go, <laughs> so they get a freeze frame or whatever, you know. <laughs> Stebo began filming himself skateboarding, and this kept him out of trouble for a while. Until one day, he approached the stoner kids at school to get his first high. He loved it and started drinking more as well. This sprawled out into a full-on alcohol addiction. Stebo was struggling with multiple addictions before even leaving high school. Stevo would attempt to take his shot at higher education, and he did actually get accepted into the University of Miami through a letter he wrote about his mom's alcoholism. He did attend the University of Miami. However, he dropped out after one year due to bad grades, destruction of property, and constant partying. If there's any one question I get asked, like by far the most, it's definitely, how'd you get into all this, you know? We're gonna retrace the steps of how it all began. They record. In the very beginning, like uh, when I was dropping out of University of Miami, like I didn't really have a concept of the real world. He was now homeless and filming himself nonstop. Is this an episode of Soft White Underbelly? No, because he would be being filmed by Mark Leta and paid forty dollars. Jumping off buildings, do. So hey, Listen, and that was back in the day. That's not adjusting for inflation. Yeah, it could have been. They need to mark me to pay his people more. <laughs> Jumping off buildings, doing skateboard tricks, and anything else to take the videos further. I started skateboarding when I was 11 years old, and I made my first video when I was 15. I was just trying to make rad skate videos, and I was okay at skateboarding, but even back then, I knew the best footage was of me slamming. When I graduated from high school, I went straight to the University of Miami, and all I wanted to do there was hang out at the pool and do dumb jumps off the diving boards, and of course, ride my skateboard, and pretty much get fucked up all the time. It was back then when I started filming really stupid shit, like stopping elevators in between floors and pissing in them. I really wasn't big on going to class, like, Honestly, the only time I ever went to the library was to repel off of it. <laughs> I knew I was failing my classes and that I wasn't going to last in school, so I came up with the idea to become like a crazy famous stuntman. And I started doing legitimately gnarly stunts, like dangling off of 12-story balcony railings by my bare hands. And like, while I was doing all this dumb shit, I was pretty much drunk off my ass the whole time. Lucky you didn't lose your bed, huh? Totally lucky. It was when I got caught on the roof of the 12-story dorm building I lived in that they kicked me out of it. And from that point on, I was homeless, just sleeping on people's floors and getting super f up. doesn't know what's going on. <laughs> he would do anything for the tiniest bit of attention and then drink through the night to completely forget all about it. He tried college again by attending the University of New Mexico and also dropped out, this time in 1997. He finally found some semblance of academic success whenever he graduated from the Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Clown College in 1997. Now, the Ringling Brothers, <laughs> the Ringling Brothers are an entire different story. I literally can't even get into that right now, but let me tell you, it is not pretty. I don't even know. Anyway. Now, the Ringling Brothers School often offered spots with their circus for the students who graduated from their school. And Steve-O had real on-the-ground training as a stuntman. Unfortunately for Steve-O, the Ringling Brothers did not choose him to be in the circus. And this was the final graduating class for the school in its history. An extremely successful circus had turned away Steve-O the Clown. And only his mother showed up for his graduation. I, uh... Graduated from Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Clown College, which is, you know, a rather prestigious accomplishment. Um, I was not chosen for uh, the Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus. I ended up getting a job on Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines as a clown, and I was fired 
unceremoniously. I was actually fired by the other clowns in my troop. They, How does that happen? Well, they uh, apparently went to the, the, the cruise ship Brass and they said, if Steve-O comes back for another contract, we all quit. <laughs> Why? Um, I, I was uh, generally disrespectful. Um, I didn't think that, that the stuff that they um, were seeking to do as performers was uh, like cool, funny, or, or rad. After this series of unfortunate events, Steve-O would turn to a Fort Lauderdale swap chop flea market to perform as a clown there, instead of the circus, where he graduated from. However, this was a pinnacle time for Steve-O as this was when he started filming his stunts and sending them to Big Brother Magazine, a skateboarding stunt magazine that the future director of Jackass, Jeff Tremaine, ran. Now, Big Brother Magazine said they were an extreme sports magazine and they leaned heavily into the extreme aspect. Steve-O really pioneered this within the magazine as he really did push the envelope. The magazine was completely boundaryless and nothing seems to really have been off limits. It wasn't going to clown college that really gave me like my big break. It was like burning my face off for Big Brother Magazine. That's what really like gave me my break. Larry Flint publishes like 20 some odd porn magazines and one skateboard magazine. Big Brother. So Big Brother comes into Albuquerque on tour with a bunch of pro skaters and Steve's at the point in his life where he's trying to get like a lot of recognition for doing stunts so he can get into magazines and stuff. Yeah, I heard the Duff's tour was coming through. I tracked their asses down. I literally, like, the Big Brother didn't know me, like, I showed up telling them, like, whether you like it or not, you're going to publish me, because what I'm going to do tonight is going to be crazy. At a house party, the backyard kegger, he, uh, he gets my attention with his little fireball trick backflip thing where he ended up burning his face off, and of course I had to write an article about that, because idiots are what make Big Brother work. Marcus there, favorite skater. He wanted him to blow it for him. He's never done it before, so he fucked up the first time, of course. It blew all the fluid all over Steve-O's face. So now his face is soaked with alcohol. His whole hair caught on fire, his face caught on fire. But Steve-O proceeded to uh, finish the trick after burning his face off. I burned my face off, dude. You gotta, you gotta go to the hospital. <laughs> Yeah, 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 we do. Your hair is fried. Your hair is gone. Oh, Steve Clown! Steve-O! You alright? Nah, not even. Steve-O! It's on my face. See, I'm fucked. Steve burned his face so bad he ended up looking like Freddy Krueger. It's horrible. That's the first time that the world escape community knew about Steve-O. Still, the next time Big Brother came through Albuquerque, I had to kind of track him down. But uh, soon enough, they were calling me to let me know like when our paths would cross. You know, I just had a good relationship with Big Brother. First time I met Steve-O was on the Big Brother Florida trip. And uh, we went straight to his house. We're all excited to meet him. I've seen all this footage of him. And he'd pretty much been calling me every day before it. And this button that just starts going crazy. Blah, 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 what is this? Blah, blah, blah. Just a backflip fireball. Blah, 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 blah. You know, I'm pretty psyched that just after about 20 minutes, I just had to get the fuck away from this guy. So we jumped in the van and we tried to ditch him. But uh, he wasn't going to let that happen. He knew that he was going to get on the video. And uh, pretty much from then on, we've had gold with him. He began sending in tricks that weren't necessarily the most technical and maybe didn't require any talent at all. But they were very extreme, and they did get the biggest reaction. After all, in clown college, the way that they would grade the clowns was based on the audience's reaction. And we already know from Steve-O's early childhood that he was obsessed with making people like him. So it, it all makes sense that these are the type of tricks he would be doing. 
Also, he's obviously talentless. So the only thing he could possibly do is tear up his human body for other people's entertainment. It's like a modern day gladiator. Cute, but no talent. I started skateboarding when I was 11 years old and I made my first video when I was 15. I was just trying to make rad skate videos and I was okay at skateboarding, but even back then I knew the best footage was of me slamming. When I graduated from high school, I went straight to the University of Miami and all I wanted to do there was hang out at the pool and do dumb jumps off the diving boards and of course ride my skateboard and pretty much get fucked up all the time. It was back then when I started filming really stupid shit, like stopping elevators in between floors and passing in them. I really wasn't big on going to class. Like, honestly, the only time I ever went to the library was to repel off of it. <laughs> I knew I was failing my classes and that I wasn't gonna last in school, so I came up with the idea to become like a crazy famous stuntman. And I started doing legitimately gnarly stunts, like dangling off of 12 story balcony railings by my bare hands. And like, while I was doing all this dumb shit, I was pretty much drunk off my ass the whole time. Lucky you didn't lose your beer, huh? Totally lucky, dude. It was when I got caught on the roof of the 12 story dorm building I lived in that they kicked me out of it. And from that point on, I was homeless, sleeping on people's floors and getting super fucked. <laughs> Once I was homeless, it became even more important to me to film super disturbing, crazy sh <laughs> Steve was dead and there's gonna be trouble. Oh. I also got injured quite a bit and sometimes seriously f badly. <laughs> But at the same time, I was working super hard to develop legitimate skills. And the truth is, I taught myself how to do some pretty damn cool stuff. After a few years of that, I started getting really confident. And then in 1997, I showed up at a skateboard convention with a videotape of all my best stunts. It was like me doing handstands on moving cars and flips off of bridges and off of buildings into super sketchy shallow pools. Steve-O was becoming very well known in the skateboarding community for these pranks and stunts and leaving his mark on the skateboarding community's history. Now, in the meantime, Bam Margera, on the other hand, is actually creating a show, starting a whole production company, getting Jackass off the ground in its infancy through the early days of the CKY crew. MTV would eventually pick up the show, change its name, hire Jeff Tremaine as editor-in-chief at Big Brother Magazine, and he was going to be the Jackass director, which he remained to be even through till today. So Big Brother Magazine is sort of absorbed into Jackass, and Steve-O is kind of automatically a part of the cast. Steve-O's drinking got even worse, and hard drugs were an everyday routine. Eventually, most of the remnants of the skateboarding would be removed in favor of triple the disgusting skits and stunts. This would become what we know today as the modern day Jackass franchise. In the year 2000, after phone call after phone call, meeting after meeting, MTV decides to air the new show. Jackass became an instant hit. Children across America were seeing some of the wildest tricks ever performed in their lives right on their TV screens. Steve-O may have burnt his face off for the Big Brother magazine, but Jackass was an entirely different ball game. He would push himself harder and further as each new movie would premiere. Movie after movie, show after show, Steve-O was getting broken and shattered into pieces. In 2003, Steve-O's mother passed away and he reconnected with his father. His father finally, after all these years, actually began to support his career for once, but there was still a sort of emptiness in their relationship. Steve-O appreciated this newfound connection with his father, but their relationship was already so incredibly damaged, they couldn't really fully connect after that. Steve-O was now completely alone with no one except the Jackass crew, encouraging him to get drunker and higher every day. They would lead him down the path of extremely dangerous pranks, near-death experiences, and fame few clowns could ever dream of. Steve-O was only being paid a few hundred dollars per stunt on Jackass. Thus, he knew if he wanted to make any long-standing income for himself, he needed other ventures. Immediately after Jackass aired, Steve-O began releasing his own set of home movies, a bunch of stunts from the 90s that never made it into Jackass. The Don't Try This At Home video would be transformed into a tour very shortly after, where Steve-O and a bunch of other 
jackasses would wreak havoc across North America. Steve-O would push his body to the brink night after night, all to be the loudest one in the room. The tour was massive, selling out nightclub after nightclub. However, Nick Dunlap, the tour manager, sold the tour for $10,000, and Steve-O only ever saw $3,000 for the 24 dates he performed at. They even sold a home video of the backstage shenanigans of the tour. In this, you can truly see a glimpse into Steve-O's lifestyle of that era. He was partying and doing reckless stunts behind the scenes as well. Living the life of a completely reckless stuntman 24-7 began to take its toll on Steve-O, and he was leaving the tour with pennies. So yeah, how it impacted me, if you're asking how alcoholism impacts me, it's f***ed up, you know, and it continues to get f***ed up. Like, it continues to maybe get worse. What I said was, I said, look, you've tied him up a million times, right? Do it now. Right, right, get, right. Get him anywhere you can, get him in the car, get him in the hospital, I don't care how you do it. There's more to me than people really know, you know? Yeah, dude.